Hello everyone, this is Gene and I'm back with another video. So I came across this uh, tweet thread by John Tobias, who as he says here on his uh, profile, I am the real Cybot, which of course is a reference to the character Noob Cybot, who was the original Sub-Zero, and by original Sub-Zero I mean the one from Mortal Kombat 1. Uh, the one that most people know of is actually the one who debuted in 2. But anyway, uh, Cybot, Noob Cybot is actually Ed Boon and, and John Tobias's last names flipped. That's where the name comes from. But it says, I am the real Cybot, co-creator of Mortal Kombat, contestant on Smash TV, artist, game developer. I think he's also worked in comics. I think he, he, he was working in comics where I'd done some comics in the early 1990s. Now, I'm going to try, try to be very brief. And I know that many of my followers are like done to death, right? Um, when it when it when it comes to me talking about Mortal Kombat, but that's actually something I wanted to point out uh, in his thread that he mentions here because um, he was asked a question, as you can see here, by a Larry White asking, "Was Striker that would be Curtis Striker who would first debut in Mortal Kombat 3, was Stryker replaced with Sonya in the first game? And John responds with Stryker, Sonya, Jack Stryker. That was name swapping madness. But Sonya Blade's inception was triggered by a scramble to add a female fighter to the first Mortal Kombat game. Fortunately, we had a core roster and themes waiting for her arrival. And he goes on to explain that. One second, okay. Eight months into development and after a successful weekend test at a Chicago arcade we knew we had something special with Mortal Kombat so we were asked to take a few extra to take a couple extra months to fine-tune the game and add a new character but who to add now here's the part I really want to focus on right the absence of a female fighter had not gone un gone unnoticed by players and folks around the studio, so the addition of a strong female character was a no-brainer. Now here's the reason why I highlight that particular point. Because the first Mortal Kombat game came out in 1992. Maybe 91 if you're counting the arcades, but certainly for the console systems like the Genesis and the Super NES, which would have been the modern gaming systems at the time. I know I was there, I had a Sega Genesis. Um, those would have been your modern systems. So those games came out in the first Mortal Kombat game came out in 1992. And when you look at the series as a whole, Mortal Kombat 1 is really sort of its own stand standalone game. I've always said that Mortal Kombat doesn't really start until MK2 with all of its themes and its look and its aesthetic and all that. But here's the thing. John says here that the absence of a female fighter had not gone unnoticed by players and people in the studio at that time. So that time, generally speaking, would have been the late 80s, probably 1989, to the early 90s, 1990, 1991. Which would mean that, unlike in today's world, where we have so many video games that have female protags or prominent female characters, and it's a sort of common thing these days to have a, a prominent female character and or a female lead, right? This didn't exist then. Your biggest female character back in the 80s probably would have been Samus Aran because of Metroid. And even then, most players at that time wouldn't have realized she was female yet. It wasn't common knowledge. And I can't even think of a fighting game at that time, between 1989 and 1991, that even had a female player. Because Street Fighter II wouldn't come out um, until maybe 91. Street Fighter 2 was like 91, 1992. So maybe Street Fighter 2 was out. Because I know that the original game drew a lot of influence from Street Fighter. So maybe you had Chun-Li. But prior to that, the only game I can think of that I'm aware of in America, or rather that was in America at that time, that, that, that had a female pro protagonist and was not quite a fighting game, but featured a female fighter, a female warrior, was Golden Axe, which was a beat-em-up, and it featured the character of Tyrus Flair, right? So I find it very interesting that even then, back in the late 80s, early 90s, according to John here, 
players, right? He says he says didn't go unnoticed by players or folks in the studio. So both the people working on the game, him, Ed Boon, and the various other people in the studio at the time, and the players felt that felt that they needed to add a female character. And the reason I bring this up is because, you know, one of the huge arguments and, and debates today in gaming, you know, is the way female characters are portrayed or how they're treated and how there's a lack of them, right? And yet you look back in the past when they were not there oftentimes, right? And you see that people were noticing this and wanting to address it even back then. So the fact that we're still having this debate of you don't have enough women or you don't portray women properly or whatever, literally 30 years, right? 30 years in the future now when so many game franchises, Mortal Kombat included, have become these you know iconic franchises and staples of gaming and yet we're still having this debate is absolutely amazing to me. So I just want to just highlight that part. And then, another part that I wanted to focus on was this, right? John says that we look to our list of archetypes, and while we cast most of the core, we were missing our skeptic. A skeptic is an archetype meant to cast doubt on the hero and whatever construct the world around them implies, right? And then he has these two images. Let me see if they'll load. Right, so I've seen this uh, before. It's the archetypes for the characters that would end up in the game. Now, especially if you're going to see the Mortal Kombat film on the 23rd, let me just point out number one. Liu Kang, hero, protagonist. I just want to emphasize that. 1992. Anyway, now Michael Grimm, I have no idea who that's supposed to be or who that character became, but it shows here Stryker, Curtis Stryker is, was, was the original skeptic. And eventually, as John says, that um, that became Sonya. And you see on the sidebar here, it says that Sonya represented the skepticism. We had to play musical chairs with the names. Uh, I, I believe the name of Sonya actually comes from Boone. One of Ed Boone's sisters is named Sonya, so he named the character in her honor. And they based the, the character's look off of, I think, Cynthia Rothrock, who almost who considered suing them, actually, <laughs> fortunately for... For them, um, she didn't. But Cynthia Rothrock at the time was, I wouldn't say a big movie star or anything, but she was well known in like the Hong Kong kung fu movie scene, right? During, during that um, era, right? But John says here they had to play musical chairs and uh, uh, and characters to get to her. That Sonya's role as a special forces operative made her not like the others, right? And then he shows this image. Can I go there? Let me see something. He shows this image here that Stryker, right, who ended up being a sort of ev everyman beat cop in Mortal Kombat 3, but originally, right, he was going to be a member of the special forces. This is more or less Sonya's basic background from the first game. So they eventually took that and gave it to uh, uh, Sonya. But something else I want to, I find interesting here ah, is the archetypes, right? The basic roles that the characters in the first game played. You have Louis the hero. I have no idea who Michael Grimm was supposed to be. I doubt it's Johnny Cage. Johnny's no one sidekick. He's too arrogant for all that. Plus he was based on Jean-Claude Van Damme. So uh, that wouldn't fit him. Curtis, as we know, was the skeptic. That was eventually Sonya's role. Raiden was the mentor, which is, which is the funny thing is that because if you re remember Mortal Kombat, the very first game, Raiden's an evil character. He wouldn't become that mentor character until Mortal Kombat 2. So I wonder what the reason was for Raiden being a bad guy in the very first game. And then it lists uh, Kano as the trickster. Then it says Ninja 1 and Ninja 2. Ninja 1's the hunter and Ninja 2 is the hunted, so that was so, I, so that's most likely Scorpion and Sub-Zero. Gon Goro, who became Goro, 
There's the Threshold Guardian, which makes sense. He's the sort of sub-boss before you fight Shang at the end of the game. Then you have Shang Lao, who became Shang Tsung, shapeshifter antagonist. And then you have Kitsune, who's the herald. That's most likely Princess Kitana, who of course didn't make it into the first game. And was a part of, was a main character in the second game, where they literally took Kano and Sonya and, and made them background characters because they were the least played characters in the first game, but they didn't want to quite get rid of them yet, so they literally put them in the background in Khan's arena and used their disappearance and capture to actually introduce the character of Jax, uh, who uh, de debuted in Mortal Kombat 2. Now, what really impresses me about this particular thread, right, uh, let's see here. And John says that Sonya represented the skepticism that they had the uh, uh, musical chairs. Right? But here's the thing. By grounding a fighter in a role, by grounding a fighter in a role that implied the realism of modern times, we could further guide the player into making assumptions about how the character fit into the fantastical world around them. And that Sonya doesn't compete initially in the tournament to save the world. She's just pursuing Kano. Right, and that, uh, here's another interesting one. In MK1, Sonya, Johnny, and even Kano, to some extent, represent the world we know. The more, in, the more enlightened fighters represent the fantasy world that they were inviting players into, and that the collision of modernity which in that case would have been the mid-1990s, and the esoteric mysticism was, still is, Mortal Kombat's secret sauce. It was the yin and yang, the balancing of the furies, too much of one or the other, and it loses its uh, mojo, <laughs> right? So he says here that Sonya shouldn't be overlooked for what she represented in the early games. Her addition solidify the use of character archetypes and that helped separate us from other fighting games and establish our world fiction. In other words, adding Sonya balance MK's furies. Bonus tweet. <laughs> MK1 Striker's backstory is used for Sonya. MK1 Striker character was renamed Jackson Briggs and was introduced in MK2. The name of Curtis Striker is used for a different character in Mortal Kombat 3. Who still holds to that tradition of an everyman character. Even even when, when he was revamped in Mortal Kombat 9, he's still a police officer or SWAT or something, which is still very much in the real world. Now, the reason I highlight this, aside from being a complete geek, is that John, I think, in this um, thread here, shows the importance of world building, of using character archetypes and and roles and just understanding how to build a story how to tell a story right which i think is is a quality is a skill that has sadly been lost not just by mortal kombat's modern writers like dominic cianciolo but also just in media in general media in general exists to subvert pretty much everything john talks about here right and it's very sad, in my personal opinion, that media today tries to subvert the sort of basic ground rules of telling a story and how different themes and, and how those characters represent those themes um, interact, right, as it were, how it helps with the overall storytelling, right, having the mentor character, having the hero, having the skeptic, having this, having that, right? As, uh, where is it, right? As John says here, right? Adding Sonya solidified their use of character archetypes and it helped establish their world fiction. I think that, that this thread alone is just great as regards um, just storytelling and story building and character building, right? And how there are certain classic tropes and roles and archetypes and why they're still used and in existence today. It's one of those things where it's like, even if you're not a Mortal Kombat fan, I think that if you're a writer or you're interested in writing or storytelling or anything, this is a thread to 
to check out because it shows the importance of these very basic building blocks of how to tell a story. Just because something is a basic idea or fundamental doesn't mean that it's not important. And more importantly, in my opinion, not everything needs to be a deconstruction or a subversion. Um, as we see oftentimes in um, uh, media, ah, as we oftentimes see in uh, media today, right? This idea that every idea must be broken down and twisted on its head. No, no. What you need are some basic building blocks and you need to know how to use them, how these roles, how these characters fit into your world to build your world. Then you can start subverting things and playing with ideas. But before you can do that, you have to know and understand the basics. And I think John's uh, little tweet thread here is a great example of that. But anyway, I just wanted to uh, focus on that. Yes, I'm being a total geek. I'm geeking out over over um, uh, John Tobias and classic Mortal Kombat. What do you expect from me? If you followed my uh, content, this is nothing new. But anyway, Jesus Christ. Anyway, um, please let me know what you think, and I will see you all in the next one. Have a good day or night wherever you are. Bye.